so, so I'm Julian Dunn. I'm a senior product manager at Chef. Uh, that's my contact information up there if you want to send me an email or follow me on Twitter. It's mostly bad tech jokes and cats, so just a forewarning. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about Chef is a remote first company. And I, th I thought I would talk about some of the lessons that we've learned, kind of scaling that as a company from about 50 people from when I first started to approximately 300 folks that work for Chef now. Um, so Chef is probably in, like every state that's colored orange up here is a state in which we have at least uh, one employee working for us across a variety of different job functions. Um, and of course we have you know, a number of offices and uh, presence in you know, Australia, and this is Germany here, um, and that's the UK. Um, and those are where our offices, our headquarters is in Seattle, Washington, um, and we have very small offices in San Francisco and in London and in Berlin. So how did we get started being a remote first company? Well, you know, it started with engineering. We wanted to hire the very best engineers, no matter where they were located uh, in the country. And particularly at, time, at that time that was driven by technical needs, um, our server product uh, was at the time, um, and some parts of it still are built in Erlang and it's a little hard to find Erlang developers. So we started with engineering. And then right around the time when I first started, which was about 2012, 2013, um, Adam Jacob, who is the founder of Chef and the CTO, he moved to San Francisco uh, because his wife Katie was starting a job with Change.org, which is an advocacy organization. She was a director or something, and so they moved there. And that's what introduced us to the concept of then distributed leadership. And so we've never really looked back from that perspective. So folks ask me all the time, you know, isn't it difficult to be a remote product manager? And of course there are challenges. There are challenges with any job. I have a different set of challenges. Um, but I don't have the, necessarily the challenge of folks driving by my desk um, and asking me random questions as one example, but you know, it makes up for it in some other areas. So um, it affords me personally great flexibility in my schedule of when I can work and what I do. And also from a, a lifestyle perspective, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to come to Detroit here specifically to give this talk, as of the first time that I've given this talk, it's a brand new talk, uh, is because I'm uh, right up from, uh, from up the road. I'm a Canadian, I walk amongst you, hidden amongst you Americans. <laughs> um, and so I've watched, you know, I have uh, friends and family in Detroit and I've certainly, you know, watched Detroit and its, um, you know, economic, you know, resurgence, both sort of the, you know, the economic problems, but also the resurgence um, from afar with a great deal of interest in the city. And, um, and you know, I regard remote working as one way in which, you know, Cities, especially you know ones in the Midwest and Detroit specifically, um, can develop new opportunities in this era when, let's say, manufacturing, domestic manufacturing, is on the wane. And me personally, how did I end up in America? Is I moved to New York in 2011 for graduate school, and I stayed on working for a startup there first in web operations, and then eventually I made my way working for Chef um, yeah, as a consultant. First of all, traveling around the country, um, and then. About three months ago, I moved to Portland, Oregon, so not to Chef Headquarters. Um, so we've been able to make, my wife and I, um, life choices in terms of where we want to live without necessarily being tied to a particular office, right, which I think is also a great benefit um, for being a remote worker. Um, so this book, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Who has seen or read this book about remote working? A couple of folks. Okay, so. Let me, um, this is from the folks at 37 Signals. This is uh, DHH, David Heinemeyer Hansen, I think I'm saying his name right, and Jason Fried. You know, they invented like Ruby on Rails and they do Basecamp and things like this. And, and um, you know, it's a business book. I, I think I would recommend the book, broadly speaking. I have maybe some qualms about some of the writing style, but broadly speaking, it's a very good book and gives you a sales pitch about like what's good about remote working. But to me, like most business books, business books tend to give you the happy path of you know, what it is if you specifically these folks created a culture and a company from scratch from the very beginning. And they're the principles of that company. So they're able to do whatever was necessary to create that culture, right? What about for folks who work in organizations today who struggle with trying to change this, right? And these books, business books generally give you, oh, everything's sunshine and unicorns. And you know that when you're making organizational change, that is definitely not the case, right? And so I wanted to open, you know, I wanted to show a little bit of, of um, chef internals and talk about how we've compensated um, for remote working um, and how we've really made a distributed uh, first culture at Chef and, and also some of the pitfalls and, and lessons that we've learned along the way as we've grown the company. 
So first of all, I think the terminology that we use when we talk about things is extremely important, so I want to bring this up right away, right? What is the difference between a remote employee for, versus a distributed team? Well, to me, a remote employee, and I'll tell you a story, I was once visiting a customer, and I was working with a team of systems administrators, and they said they had a coworker, Bob, who worked on their team but had not been to the office in two years. They hadn't seen him at all. And you could tell that Bob was just not treated as a first-class citizen on this team, right? They'd call him once a day for stand-up on the end of a poor conference, conference line, but they didn't really treat him. They tr sort of treated him like onshore outsourcing, you know? Like he wasn't really part of the group. So that, to me, is like the worst you know, the worst than of being a remote employee. Whereas in a distributed team, everybody is equal and, and you optimize the culture and you optimize the tools for being distributed first. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One is, why is it that if you're working remotely, you don't get to have nice furniture? Everybody at headquarters or everybody working in an office gets to have one of these and your office chair looks like this thing that you found by the side of the curb, right? So what what Chef does is they provide every employee with a $1,000 stipend, it's a one-time thing, and you can choose to spend that on whatever office furniture you want, right? If you want a standing desk and a nice air on chair, and if you can make that fit in, your, in that $1,000 funding envelope, or if you want to put in a little bit extra, go for it, right? Another example is all hands meetings. So, you know, the remote folks don't get stuck on some crappy dial-in, you know, some WebEx that isn't working properly, the audio quality is awful, or people are laughing at things at headquarters, at jokes, you know, that you can't hear and that the audio is really bad and you're missing half the meeting and then afterwards everybody at headquarters goes to get lunch because they have a nice catered lunch and then you go get your tuna sandwich or something from your fridge, you know, no, you don't really want that, right? So at Chef, we deal with this by having our all-hands meetings where everybody is conducting the, their session remotely. Even, for example, if you have the executives, let's say the CEO or the CFO, they're all doing the all-hands meetings in a format like this, right? Where they are, this is not an all-hands meeting where they're drinking, this is our virtual happy hour, which is another thing that we do. But you'll see, like, our, our CEO, Barry, is, you know, he would do an all-hands from his home office and our CFO would do the all-hands meeting dialing in from his own home office as well, right? Or maybe some, you know, cubicle or something inside the inside headquarters, right? So it gives everybody the same experience and you're on a level playing field. And as I mentioned, this is how you deal with um, not having sort of the, the hallway, hey, let's go get a beer, let's go get a non-alcoholic beverage or whatever it is, right? So we do virtual happy hours periodically on, on Fridays. When I was thinking about distributed teams, I was thinking about Distributed teams having a lot in common with distributed systems, and I promise this is the last Rust joke that I'll make. Uh, we use a lot of Rust at Chef. But, you know, you can learn a lot about what, what make good distributed teams from looking at what make good distributed systems. So perhaps let's start there. And in distributed systems, we have this theorem called the CAP theorem, which is written by Eric Brewer, famous computer scientist, which basically states, you know, it is impossible for a distributed data store to simultaneously provide more than two out of these three characteristics, consistency, availability, or partition tolerance. Now, fortunately for teams of, uh, for distributed teams, availability, I mean, we're not building a web service here, we're building teams. And also, like, there's just some physical constraints in the real world that prevent you from having your entire team available at all times. First of all, nobody's figured out how to solve time zones, right? Those are a thing. Um, people have appointments that they need to go to. People have personal time. You know, maybe their kid is sick and they need to take their kid out of school. They'll have other life events that are happening and people are on vacation, right? So fortunately, we can simply build our distributed teams to optimize for consistency and partition tolerance. And how do we do this? Well, consistency. A remote first company has to still work as one has to be one vision, one strategy, one set of goals towards that strategy. So that requires shared alignment. And shared alignment is basically making sure that everybody working on something has a common set of answers and the same answers, same understanding about answers to these questions, right? So where are we going with the company and our product and our work? And why are we going there? How are we gonna get there? So how is an acceptable path from an engineering perspective? What technologies are we going to use? What's our architecture look like? What does quality look like? And then how does the work that you're working on in a sprint or an iteration uh, attach to that particular direction? To make this more concrete, we talk about strategy, right? 
And my experience with strategy prior to working as a product person was, you know, folks like this guy, okay, AOL Digital Profit, go around and wave your hands around, the, you know, and that's strategy. That is not strategy. Okay, strategy is actually very, there's a m method to strategy, and that involves you defining things um, in a methodical way, according to, you know, what is it that our company, or what are we trying to aspire to, do, you know, working at this company? Where do we play? What markets are we trying to capture? Also, what markets are we not trying to capture? How do we win in those markets that we're choosing to play in? What capabilities do we need to win? And that's not just operations or engineering. Sometimes that can be marketing. Sometimes that can be I need a new, a different sales force. Sometimes it's about pricing. Sometimes it's about you know branding. Many factors. And then finally, metrics, right? So what systems and metrics and processes as well do we need to be able to have in place to measure and track that winning? So. In a remote first company, it's very important that we create artifacts around this and not just talk about them, right? So the way in which we do this is, you know, uh, product specifically, and we provide input, but leadership owns a very top level strategy that is, that evolves and that covers about two quarters and we change it about that frequently, right? Um, it's digestible by everyone in the company. It's about five or six pages long and is publicly available, well, publicly available inside the company, right? And then from there, Product managers and product teams write framing documents around the particular initiatives that they're going to be working on. Cover one initiative, it's a little bit shorter, three to five pages. It's owned by product. And again, this is published and circulated and, and um, shown to everybody in the company and that they can refer to at any time if they get lost about how, what, what exactly we're doing, right? If they lose the alignment with what it is that we're, we're trying to accomplish at the company. In terms of partition tolerance, it's basically the need for the culture to support employees operating autonomously, right? As I mentioned, people are all over, they're traveling, whatever, you know, I'm here at a conference, you know, people have different schedules and they're doing different things, right? So some of the cultural aspects for, and support for autonomy that we put in place are, um, the type of culture that we have are, we have a very, very high trust culture, right? If you're hired at Chef, we're assuming that you're gonna be given uh, the, the, you know, that you're a smart person and we're gonna give you, give you a lot of trust, we're gonna trust you to do the right thing. The right thing by our product, the right thing by our customers. With that high trust, if you assume, if you assume that you trust people quite a bit, then it allows, to be, allows you to be very transparent with folks, not only about the strategy, but in terms of even things like our financials. We are very, very transparent with our financials, with our churn numbers, with our profit and loss internally inside the company. Much more transparent than any company that I've worked for, right? If you assume that people can trust folks, you can be very transparent with them. We measure folks by outcomes and not how much, you know, how much they're creating, how much output, right? So we don't care if you're sitting in a chair all day, right? We don't care to have people show up and just sit there and generate reams of paper. We want people to deliver good outcomes for the company and also for themselves as well, right? One of those things that is important um, in order to facilitate this is to have very clear and direct communication. Sometimes this can be extremely difficult, especially when you need to confront people or give people feedback. Um, positive feedback is easier to give, but you know, when you have to give people negative feedback, is you want to give it to them straight, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to just beat around the bush or be passive aggressive with them. And so we found this framework and this book, um, there's a bunch of training that goes along with this called Fierce Conversations, extremely helpful in, in um, framing for us how to have very direct conversations with our peers, be able to give feedback to anyone, not just our peers, but even to executive management if necessary. Conway's law has been brought up a couple of times, right, which is like, you know, your the systems that you build are gonna map clearly to your organization, so for example, if you have three teams making a compiler, you're gonna get a three-pass compiler, right? So rather than fighting Conway's Law, we try to embrace Conway's Law, and there's, you know, these, this is a, actually an old book, which you can kind of tell from the graphic design, which is sort of straight out of 1995 here. Uh, it's called Domain Driven Design. This is really, you know, as a book that's 25 years old at this point, is really like microservices, that's the hipster term for it now, right? But microservices and service-based architectures are really a way of embracing Conway's Law and aligning teams, you know that teams are gonna naturally be inclined towards an architecture that is like Conway's Law, so you might as well just organize yourselves like that anyway to start with, right? And then finally, choosing appropriate tool, tools to support a remote first culture, as I mentioned. So that's what I'm gonna um, be talking about next. 
So appropriate use of tools, right? So what are some of the upsides and downsides of remote culture and the tools that we've chosen to use and tried out? As a startup, we, you know, you, anybody has the credit card where you can just swipe it and get a SaaS, so you can often end up with a, with a plethora of tools, right? So, we, so we've, you know, we're very, very careful about choosing tools now along sort of three main axes. So number one, is it a good compensating control, if you will, for being a distributed team? Does it help with our communication? Does it help facilitate and support some of the cultural aspects that I mentioned before and our values? Number two, I think this is really, really important. I have a few examples of this. Are we prepared to invest the time to set the norms of usage around the tool, especially if it's a communication tool that we're using? And then number three is, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Like, do we already have one of these? And sometimes the answer is yes, but we still want this tool because it fulfills a particular use case, right? For example, why we have Box as well as Google Drive. Number, the second point is really important, right? Because as my friend Bridget Cromhout, who works for um, Microsoft now, says, you know, containers, she's using containers as an example of a tool, you know, a tool is not going to fix your broken culture. So this is my favorite one. How many of folks here use Slack? So keep your hands up if you hate Slack. Okay, so it's been a ba bit of a backlash about Slack, I think, in about the last year or so. Um, and I think the backlash is because folks are not setting appropriate norms of usage around Slack, or what I call etiquette, Slack etiquette. So let me just give you some tips about Slack etiquette that, I, that we use at Chef and that I've adopted. Some of these are my tips, some of these are sort of the way we use it at Chef. First of all, Slack and instant messaging systems, to me, are asynchronous mediums. It means that they're not like text messaging or calling people, right? There's no SLA around a response on Slack, okay? Maybe, maybe this is controversial, but to me. Um, so I tell people, if you Slack me, I, if I'm around, I will get back to you as soon as I can, um, typically within a couple of hours if I'm available. Number two, I actually have all push notifications for Slack turned off. They don't go to my phone. I have the Slack client on my phone, so you know, if I'm eating lunch or something, I might check it. But it's not a good way for you to reach me if you need me right away, right? You could pick up the phone or you can text message me. My phone number is available in my Slack profile. Number three, I minimize the channels that I idle in. I don't idle in 500 channels if people want to talk to me about a certain topic, right? I think that was how Slack intended for the channels to be used, for particular topical discussions or a particular thread, jump into a channel, talk about it, and leave, right? Otherwise, it's just a giant fire hose of information that you're trying to, you know, separate the signal from the noise, and that just makes no sense. Number four, I mean, this is just, I think it's just polite, keeping an accurate away status, right? So again, you can know if you, you know, the person's gonna respond very quickly or not. Um, to me, it's a business hours only thing. Maybe that's different for folks that work in operations, right, as I used to. So, you know, there's notifications, of course, that happen all the time, but to me, you can reach me during business hours, right? Again, this helps with the work-life balance thing, which often, often can also be an issue in remote first cultures, overwork. Some things that are rude, I think, um, and that we, we, tr we feel are rude. It's rude to at mention people in passing in a channel unless you really want to get their attention, right? So instead of at Jay Dunn, blah, 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 Jay Dunn did something, whatever, like if you're saying Julian sent the customer this, or whatever, like just use my name, right? And so that's what we do, right? Or, or some people have adopted the style of like Jay dash Dunn so it doesn't fire an alert word. That's a good way of doing it. And then finally, I think it's just, you know, at here, overuse of at here. At here is not a way in which you jump to the top of the priority queue, right? There's gonna be a fable, I'm sure somebody's gonna write a fable about the boy who cried at here too much and was totally ignored, right? It's the Aesop's fable for the, for the 21st century. Okay, so let's talk about Jira. How many folks use Jira here? Right, a lot. And we've had a long experience with using Jira. Right, we've used Jira for almost since the, I think probably since the, since the inception of the company. We've made a lot of mistakes with Jira. This is probably our third Jira install. Actually, we use the cloud Jira now, the hosted service, right, because Jira is kind of a pain to maintain and update. But what we've settled on, how Jira is used really, what Jira is really, really good at is as an engineering execution tool and attempts to try and use it for something other than as an engineering execution tool 
to do project management, to do you know, idea management, to do whatever, those are not good ideas. You should not use JIRA that way. So what we do is we feed JIRA with information from other tools from upstream. So we do product planning and sprint planning and just generally what we're doing in an initiative in a different product called Mural. And Mural is basically just a glorified, you can think of it as a glorified sticky board, right? If you were all in one office and you had access to unlimited sticky notes, post-it notes, Mural is what you would have. Or it's got a lot of other features, but that's sort of um, basically how we use it, right? It's, it's, it's where you do your rough work. It's your fool scap, if you're old enough to remember that. Um, so that's where engineering, design, and product do the rough work and the, fin and the refining of the stuff so that engineering can execute. Then we actually feed Mural with another product that we, that, that's called ProdPad. This is a SaaS service for product managers. This is where you, we can keep all kinds of half-baked ideas or customer feedback, like literally raw customer feedback or things that we're noodling on and ideas and all this kind of stuff, just really, really rough things. And we can also, we also do our roadmap planning and research and things like this and develop our personas and mock-ups and all this stuff within this system. This is where you do your strategy, right? So you can see that there's a clear delineation between tools that you're using, we're using for strategy and tools that we use for, for execution, which I think is extremely important. This is Mural, this all comes to bear in Mural. This is how you do, how we use Mural most of the time. We use it for a lot of other things too, but this is how we plan, how we do um, initiatives at Chef, right? And this is all stems from this book um, written by a fellow named Jeff Patton. Highly recommend this book as well as his in-person training, um, which is called Passionate Product Ownership. And it teaches everyone, not just product folks, but engineering folks and, and design folks and operations folks, like what it takes to build, like what is, how you can build uh, modern products really, really efficiently. So the idea is what you want to start, what, you, what we like to start with, especially as technical folks, is we start with tasks. We like to think of tasks, right? And so what you actually do is you write down all the tasks and just spread them all over this map, right, completely as if you know, as if you were writing post-it notes, you stick them all against the wall. And then we start to organize them into a cohesive storyline, right? What is the user actually going to do to get from, you know, when they haven't done the job with the product to when they finish the job with the product, right? And so that's your backbone and your storyline. So we write a story for that. Then you can start categorizing these ideas or these tasks, these things that the user is going to do or things that you just need to get done implementation-wise into slices of releases, right? Um, well, my laser pointer is somewhere. Um, but anyway, so the idea is in a release slice, what you don't want to do is, is you want to make sure that each part of this backbone, some part, like you still have a through line and a story in every single release that you're shipping to the customer, right? What you don't want is in the past, we've built systems like we spent six weeks building only the authorization and authentication component for a system. And it's gold-plated, right? It's awesome. It can connect to like OAuth and AD and all this stuff, but the user can't actually do anything. So what's the point? There's no value there, right? So what you want when you're doing work is to, to give the customer still some way of accomplishing that job, even though it's very thin and might not have all the bells and whistles, but they can still do something with it, right? So highly recommend this book. That's how we use Mural and how we do the work. Because at the end of the day, what it is that's important about doing work is about the, you know, it's about telling the stories, it's about communication. I've touched on communication a lot, right? The tools and the culture are there to support and facilitate good communication. This is a picture of me um, on, on vacation uh, about 10 years ago. You can see I was a lot younger and had shorter hair. Um, now, it looks like I'm at a botanic garden and I'm saying to my wife, what a beautiful rose, right? Which is kind of true, I guess. But without me telling the story behind this, which is that actually the glasses that I'm wearing there, I had just gotten the day before while I was on vacation. Why had I gotten those glasses while I was on vacation? Because two days prior to that, I had gone swimming, or I guess I had waded into the Atlantic Ocean, and this giant wave came behind me and swept me under and then tore my glasses off. So there's some lobster somewhere in the Atlantic, I think, that has really nearsighted lobster that has really good vision. So. I had to go get new glasses while I was on vacation, and the glasses were very poorly manufactured, and actually, you know, basically, like, one eye, was, one eye was totally screwed up versus the other one. I actually couldn't see a bloody thing, right? But it doesn't look that way. So now that I've told you this story, this vacation story, that's a whole different thing than if you took this artifact, right, 
and, and you were to try to explain to somebody what this artifact was about, right? This is why we don't write complicated or long PRDs, product requirement documents and things like this, right? Because it's really in the communication and the telling of the story that the nuance comes out, right? So therefore, it breaks down into our JIRA boards, which look something like this, very, very simple. It's a Kanban board, right? There's not that many columns on it. As you can see, there's not that many cards on this, right? So another thing, don't overpopulate the backlog with too much crap, because things are gonna change all the time, right? There's like 13 cards on this board, maybe, 10 to 13 cards on this board, right? You prioritize the work over here, engineering analyzes the work, writes the code, they review the code, right? goes into an acceptance environment, product looks at the work, if it's a user-facing story, and then we accept it and move it to deliver, right? So very, very simple. That's how we use Jira. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about unsolved problems. What are the, some, some of the things that we're still working on in a remote culture, remote-first culture? Um, so number one, in keeping everybody up to date across the company with sort of internal broadcast communications. This is anywhere from things like who's leaving and joining the company to even things like changes in our product strategy or our product suite or how we're positioning things or whatever, right? And I think how we're going to need to improve and evolve this is product marketing is, needs to be internally facing as well as externally facing, right? G generally, at a company of our size, you have somebody that's, that is in, in charge of internal communications as well. Um, number two, you know, remote leadership can still be a challenge for sure, right? Especially once you get to more senior ranks, right? Executives or C-level. And I haven't quite figured out the genesis of like why this is. I'm, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, your executives sometimes tend to be a little bit older, right? Because they have a lot more experience. And sometimes they have some, you know, they, they're just not as comfortable using, um, they're not sort of digital natives and are as used to using some of the tools to do remote leadership, right? We're getting better at this. Um, but, you know, it's still going to take some time. Um, number three, what I call direct conversations with lower stakes. This is like, you know, if I had a problem with Jerry, let's say, um, if I was working in an office and it wasn't a huge problem that I had with Jerry, just something about Jerry was annoying me, that's something that he did or whatever, right? Then I might not be like, I'm going to go over to Jerry's desk and I'm going to confront him right away, right? I might be like, next time I see Jerry in the lunchroom, I'd be like, hey, Jerry, you know, that thing that you, that you did, whatever, it could have gone better and so on and so forth. In a remote first culture, the only choice you really have is you can slack Jerry or you can get on a Zoom right, and say, and really deliver it to his face. So this kind of raises the stakes a little bit, right? Um, so figuring out how to deliver feedback that's actually not that high stakes, but using communication mechanisms that raise the stakes is still a little bit of a, bit of a rough edge. A number four is, you know, clear delegation of authority. Um, and I think this is true for many companies, right, whether or not you're in person, but it, it particularly is a, it, um, can, can be a, a bigger problem if you're in a remote company where you don't necessarily have the, the signals that you can read um, of how, like you can't, without, if people don't explicitly state how much authority they're delegating to you to make a decision, it's kind of hard to read their body language or whatever, right? So I think one of the things, this is also comes from fierce conversations. Um, it comes, it's a philosophy known as the tree model for explicitly saying how much authority you're giving to folks um, to make a decision. So a leaf, for example, is making a decision, act on it, don't report the action you took all the way up to a root decision, which is, you know, your manager wants you to make that decision jointly um, with input from many people, right? And so I think that's something, something that we're going to try. We're going to ask, you know, be working with um, middle managers um, to really explicitly state what it is that their delegation level is for a particular thing. And then finally, I think I touched on this before, right? Making sure there's cultural norms in place to avoid overwork. Because if you're sitting at your computer at home, right, you could just be like, oh, I'm going to pick up work after dinner, and then three hours later, you're still working, right? Um, so, you know, just putting in place, and I think we're pretty good at this, but, you know, whenever I see engineers being like, well, this thing was really bothering me, so on Saturday, I'm going to, I'm like, stop, right? On Saturday, you should be hiking, or you should be, like, on your bike, or whatever it is. I don't want you writing software, right? You should have a life. Okay, so just really briefly to wrap up, Designing remote-first companies, it has to be very intentional, and I've given some sort of cultural elements for how we do it and how we've really thought about it at Chef. Um, I think cultures have to be, remote-first cultures have to be high trust, have a high degree of autonomy, and they have to be based on people's outcomes and what they're achieving. 
And then number three, when you're thinking about the tools used to support that culture, really be careful um, in, in selecting them and very, very intentional about that selection, right? And setting the right norms in place before really fully adopting those tools. So with that, I would like to leave it there and thank you for your time. Thank you. We have like one question, if somebody wants to ask it. Okay. 